Prime Minister, dear guests, students, and colleagues, welcome to the 2016 Lemkel Lecture at NHH. First, some practical information. Emergency exits are on, to my left, towards the road. The doors will open automatically in case of need. On the balcony, the exit is to my right. There is no need to walk downstairs. After the lecture, there may be time for a few questions from the audience. This year, it's 100 years since 193 men formed an association with the explicit goal to establish a Norwegian business school in Bergen. Christopher Lemke was the chairman. He was a successful businessman in the fishing and later the shipping industries. And for a brief but extremely important period in, of this nation's history, he was a member of the cabinet. There is no doubt whatsoever that uh, Lemke was the main driver behind the successful campaign to establish NHH in Bergen. In just 16 months, he managed to convince the Storting not only to establish a business school, but also obtain agreement on its location in this city. This is nothing short of a miracle. I'm happy to tell you that Christopher Lemke's views on higher education, his thoughts on the usefulness of research for business, his strong support for academic freedom is still worth reading. His ideas and values are certainly not out of date. Every September since 1958, NHH has organized a lecture in honor of Christopher Lemke, featuring a prominent representative from Norwegian business or government. To celebrate the centennial of Lemke's great efforts for the school, we invited the most prominent of them all. We are extremely happy that our Prime Minister, Anna Solberg, has accepted our invitation to present this year's Lemke lecture. The title of the lecture is The Norwegian Economy in a More Volatile World. Anna Solberg, the aula is yours. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so students and professors. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to the Norwegian School of Economics, ANOHO, to give this year's Lemkul uh, lecture. And thank you for this opportunity to make an extra trip to Bergen, uh, which I always enjoy. And first of all, I would like to congratulate you on your 80th anniversary and the hundreds uh, anniversary since Christopher Didrik Lemkul founded and became the first chairman of the Foundation for Establishment of Anno in Bergen. It's Lemkul have given his name to this lecture, and he is often referred to as the father of Anno. And uh, it should be no surprise that it took a citizen of Bergen and a conservative politician to found Norway's first proper school of economics and management. Since its first opening in 1936, ANO has prepared thousands of students to take on management challenges in a rapidly changing world. Today, in 2016, ANO is a popular place to study high, with high academic standards and an international profile in terms of both the study, study programs and uh, an international profile also on its research activities. I gather, for example, that more than half of the annual students take uh, part in exchange abroad during the course of their studies at annual, which is a dramatic change since the time I was studying. Very few were allowed to do it at that time. But there's also many international students who also come to study at annual each year. This is not what I was supposed to speak about. My subject was the Norwegian economy in a volatile world, and I believe that it couldn't be more fitting in these days. As you know, Norway is a small country with an open economy. I suppose that Victor Norman's book still is on the agenda. It was when I studied economics in the 1980s too. Uh, everything that affects our economy and uh, political uh, partners affects us too. So I would like to start by um, pointing at three global trends that are significant for us in Norway. The first is a new sense of global unease. During the course of the three years I've been prime minister, a number of developments have created anxiety and uncertainty 
First, Russia's aggression in Ukraine and its uh, annexation of Crimea. A sharp drop in oil prices, which have had major economic consequences around the world. 65 million people, more than three times the population of Scandinavia, have been forced to flee their homes. And 2015 was the year that the refugee crisis hit Europe. And we have seen senseless, brutal acts of terrorism in several European countries. The referendum in the UK and the majority vote of Brexit leads to this unsecurity and unease in the world. And also the attempted military coup in Turkey. In addition to this, there's great uncertainty about the economic development in China and other emerging economies. All of this affects Norway and the Norwegian economy. As an open economy, we have reaped the benefits of globalization up until now. But at the same time, we have become more vulnerable to many of the great uncertainties in the world around us. To me, it's very clear that the answer to more uncertainty, and these uncertainties that we see, is closer international cooperation and more joint solutions. Unfortunately, what we are seeing is signs that nationalism and isolationism are on the rise, both in Europe and in the US. And I'm worried that we will see more protectionism and more countries try trying to go it alone. If we reach the stage where it's no longer possible to solve problems and crises through common efforts, we could see greater political unrest and weaker economic growth. And I mean, this is in fact the big issue when you look at elections around Europe and elections in the United States. It's, it is a danger that we have to take into effect. In order to avoid this, European leaders must face up to the unease and the lack of confidence that many people feel today. As politicians, we cannot claim any credibility that we are doing a good job if we fail to address the problems that are affecting ordinary people in their everyday lives. And I think this will be our greatest challenge in the time ahead. The second thread I would like to highlight is climate change. In much of Norway, we have had a record warm September. Even in Bergen, people have enjoyed an Indian summer. You know, usually, students that come from the east part of Norway should now be very moody, because it's supposed to rain all September, but you have, you have uh, had a very different, uh, different experience. And I suppose many people don't have any objection to that, but this is not the long-term climate train for Norway and for the western part of Norway. The, the long-term uh, trend is towards stormier and wetter weather. In other parts of, world, of the world, the challenges are much more serious. Some countries are at risk of being wiped off the map. Uh, in others, drought, extreme weather, and flooding are creating ever-increasing problems and causing uh, ever greater suffering for the population. We need to act, and we need to act fast. The challenges caused by climate change are global, and we need global solutions. And fortunately, this is an area of hope when you look at what happens internationally. The growing recognition of these challenges are, in, uh, are absolutely increasing, and it's what we, do, we must do to address them that's in the focus of a lot of debates. The green shift has started, and we have all a responsibility for ensuring that it's a success. And the Paris Agreement gives grounds for optimism. It sets a clear course for global climate efforts in the time ahead. And earlier this month, the, the, this month, the world's two largest economies, US and China, committed themselves to fulfilling the agreement's objectives. It's a strong signal of support to the global climate efforts. The Paris Agreement gives another signal. That is that the green solution must offer good returns on investment. I am convinced that the transition to a low-carbon society will pick up speed, but it will not happen 
if greens, green solutions threaten to put investors into red. The third trend I would like to draw attention to is the increasing importance of new technology into our daily lives, both at work and at home. We are on the threshold of a new technology revolution, which will link robots, intelligent ICT systems, our physical environment, and people together in completely new ways. And what will this mean, this mean for us as employees or as citizens? It will mean that the way we do our work and the way that we interact in other areas of society will change fundamentally. Of course, the new technology will open up huge opportunities for value creation and for improving and simplifying our lives. We were able to produce more in a shorter peak of time, and we will re be relieved of many dull tasks, and we will have the technology to help us deal with many of life's everyday challenges. Not at least for people who today have disabilities, who will have very new opportunities. And I have to admit that the idea of a domestic robot that cleans the floors while I do something more enjoyable sounds uh, very appealing. If they also can learn to tidy, I would be even more happy. Uh, but I suppose that's, that's a very future technology. Uh, for Norway, the new technology, uh, technology uh, the revolution is good news. If you look at it on the whole. Um, because our labor market and our population, population are well equipped to meet demands of an ever more globalized and knowledge intensive society. However, it will also mean that in Norway too, jobs will be automated at a rate we have never seen before. In 20 years time, one out in three Norwegian workers may have been replaced by technology. And globally, we are talking about several hundred million jobs that could be automated. And the perspective, of course, is that for a lot of those countries who have now had their force in cheap labor, this is going to be a big challenge. The textile workers of Bangladesh might be more hit than the workers in a modern uh, economy like Norway. The advantages and the opportunities are obvious. But we are also at risk of people finding themselves outside the labor market with no livelihood and no jobs to go to. This is not supposed just to be a gloomy speech, but I would just say I have painted this picture of a world that is less stable, more uncertain than it has been for a long time. But the global trends I have highlighted also offer some major opportunities. Opportunities to create jobs that will give us livelihoods in the future. Opportunities to improve and safeguard our welfare services. An opportunity to make Norway a winner, also in a more volatile world. And I believe there are three questions that we, as a nation, must have good answers to. For the first, how can a small open economy flourish in a world where isolation is increasing. Secondly, how can we make the green shift a commercial success? And thirdly, how can we make sure that there are jobs for everyone in the new labor market? And do we have answers to these questions? Well, I think we have sketches of the answers. Uh, and I think we can give the good answers in the years to come. I believe we can only address the new international unease by cooperating more closely and finding more joint solutions. And there's a lot of stake here. We must defend the world order. International law, including the law of the sea and the strong institution that has been established internationally and in Europe, contributes to Norway's security and to our competitiveness. We need more trade, not less trade, to succeed in the future. Norway has played a leading role in the efforts to build up these institutions, and we will shoulder our part of responsibility for defending and strengthening them. And we must do this even when it is costly and when populist forces are seeking to undermine them. 
I've been asked to co-chair the Sustainable Development Go Goals Advocacy Group together with President Ga of Ghana, John Lemane Mahama. This is an important task. The Sustainable Development uh, Goals are ambitious and they are crucial to securing our common future. It's an agenda, it's a, it's a roadmap for how to deal with the conflicts and the situations of the world on it, at, it, at its root causes. They are crucial to securing our common future, and we must e eliminate extreme poverty, but we must do so in the way that they safeguard the environment and addresses climate change. And the key to success is to get every UN member state to back UN's uh, processes and to help to uh, ensure that they remain relevant for all members. And we can only resolve the huge challenges facing the world by binding cooperation and joining efforts towards those common goals. And I mean that Norway should be at the forefront of these efforts. The UK decision to leave EU has uh, created uncertainty about the future European cooperation. This comes at a time when it is more important than ever that the European institutions do their job and help developing the solutions to the challenges that Europe is seeking and that the uh, EU members are, uh, countries are facing. EU must help to maintain stability and predict uh, predictability. This means stabilizing Europe's uh, unpredictable neighboring areas and ensuring that Europe is able to deal with a large flow of migrants and refugees crossing its borders. This is on the table at the European discussions today, uh, these weeks, and they need to find solutions to it. Unless I think the solidarity inside the EU is going to is going to become much, much smaller in the years to come. They must promote economic growth and job creation. Otherwise, we risk a whole generation being left behind without hope for the future and without livelihoods. And they must find answers to the challenges that affect everyday lives of people in Europe. And I can promise that Norway will shoulder its share of responsibility and take part in international processes to address these challenges. For a small open economy like ours, there is no alternative to international trade and binding cooperation, and we are all benefiting from it. Norway faces a twofold challenge in the time ahead. Our oil and gas industry will give us uh, substantial revenues also in the years to come, but it will no longer be the engine of economic growth that has been during the far past few decades. We need to create new jobs in other productive and profitable industries. At the same time, Norway must help to ensure that the world achieves the two degree target and we intend to be climate neutral by 2050. We will make the transition to a low carbon economy. The key to tackle these two challenges is to create green jobs that generate tax revenues and benefit society as a whole. I meet more than enough people with ideas for subsidized jobs. But we cannot live up subsidies. We can't have a green shift that puts us in the red. We need to be able to create jobs that also uh, supports the budget, not just has, uh, has, is a part of it. This does not mean that the state have no role to play in the transition to a green economy. We need to do our part if we are to exploit the full potential of a green economy. And you know, Norway has been through difficult re uh, restructuring processes before. In the 1800s, we made a transition from agriculture to industrial society. In the early 1900s, so the development of hydropower the first major industries, which gave raise, rise to new jobs and good revenue. The later part of the 20th century brought rapid and far-reaching technological advances that made the oil age possible. Time and again, we have seen that new challenges result in new technology, new jobs and uh, new industries. But the situation is different today. 
we need to make a transition from a highly profitable oil and gas industry to something that may have a more normal level of profits. And Norway's history is that um, we have always moved in the direction of something that becomes more profitable. The new climate economy report from the Global Commission on the uh, Economy and Climate has shown that making the transition to a green economy can be profitable. Technological innovation, investments in low emission alternatives can lead to stronger growth, more jobs, higher profits for companies and can spur economic development. And I would like to mention three examples of how new technology is being used in combination with Norwegian resources to create growth and greener society. Fusenvin is to build what will be Europe's largest onshore wind power facility. It's an investment of uh, 11 billion Norwegian kroners. Hydro's plant on Kame is developing more climate-friendly alumina, aluminum production with Norwegian 1.5 billion in government support channel, channeled through Enova. Parts of the plant's electricity need will be supplied from Fusenvin. Alkem produces the world's most environmentally friendly solar grade sil uh, silicium. It's currently developing new operations within with the support of Enova, amounting to Norwegian uh, to 72 million Norwegian kroners. There are examples that we are moving ahead on the green shift in Norway. And some good old companies are part of the green shift. Just a month ago, I visited Slovakia. There I had the chance to visit the Norwegian company Tomra, which most of us know because we are putting our boxes, uh, beer, you know it because you put your beer boxes there if you are doing it, uh, and get money back. Tomra started out in the 1970s in a garage in Asker, 20 kilometer, kilometers west of Oslo, with the development of the first machine for returning empty boxes. It's since grown into a global company offering smart solution for promoting effective use of world resources. With its sensor-based technology, the facility in Slovakia takes 15 minutes to sort enough waste to fill an entire football stadium. The technology developed in Norway by Tomra has turned waste into resources. It's part of the new recycling industries. This is good for environment, it's good for business, and it proves that green transition and green technology can be profitable. And of course, I should like to mention the Norwegian electric, uh, electric vehicle policy. There are no, now more than 70,000 electric passenger cars in use in Norway, and nearly 9,000 electric vans. A couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to test drive Norway's first electric lorry by the company Asko in Oslo. It was a lot of fun, uh, but I'm, I think I have to admit I'm glad I don't have to reverse it around a tight corner. It's, uh, it's not my, my, my best uh, things I'm best at doing. But most of the electric vehicles Norway now have has come on the road the past five years and now account for 3% of all passenger cars. It means a 70,000 ton reduction of CO2 emissions and improved air quality in our cities. It also shows that targeted policies and good use of market forces produces results. I think that new, the new technology uh, revolution is first and foremost an advantage for Norway. The factors that made the oil advantage possible now gives us an excellent starting point for exploiting new opportunities and creating new jobs based on new technology. Why do I believe that? Well, we have a knowledge-based business uh, sector with extensive digital expertise. And we have highly skilled workers and engineers who are able to apply new technology. And we have established close cooperation between the trade unions, private sector, and the authorities. And we are making major investments in research and development to make sure that we can 
compete. And this summer we saw a good example of uh, what we can achieve. Kverna announced that it mo was moving much of the production work on Johan Sverdrup platform back to Norway for the simple reason that it's cheaper in Norway than in Dubai. And who would have thought that a couple of years ago? Automation, the use of robots, better production planning is the reasons why. The result is the creation of a lot more jobs at Kranops plant at Vadal and Stone, as well as at subcontractors elsewhere in the country. And much more than we thought it would be when they first were given the job, when they won the bid. It also means that Krana can take on 120 uh, apprentices a year. New technology can also encourage companies to bring highly skilled jobs back to Norway from low-cost countries. And that's what we are seeing now. It can improve the competitiveness of the Norwegian business sector. It can help usher a new golden age in Norway's industrial development. But that doesn't mean that there is jobs for all, automatically. So how can we make sure that everyone is able to take part in the new technological revolution? Will there be room for everyone in the new labor market? My overall, overall vision of that is that we cannot afford to leave anyone behind. There's a number of things we have to do. We must make sure that our education system gives everyone a good start in life. Education is the most effective tool we have for ensuring opportunities for all. We need to make sure that no children fall behind in the crucial first year of school. That is why I have announced that our new education initiative will focus on the first few years of primary school. Because we know that's when the path for falling out, both of school and the labor market, starts. We have also strengthened the focus on learning in school through knowledge uh, promotion reform, a major effort to boost uh, teaching skills. And we must ensure peop the people have the level of education needed to safeguard our welfare system in the future. In recent years, it's been said that too many people are taking master degrees. I disagree. And I know that the Productivity Commission also disagrees with me. Uh, disagrees. We need more, not fewer, highly qualified and highly skilled people. But we must also make people aware of high demand for skilled workers at the same time. Our biggest challenge is when people take higher but too short education and on subjects that will not be that needed in the future in the labor market. We must show also that vocational training can lead to an exciting and challenging career path. And anyone who has got a bill for the plumber or uh, a building company knows that the, the jobs are not very badly paid. Uh, they are quite well paid, in fact. It's a good career path, too. We need to see better results in maths and science subjects. A quarter of the pupils leaving lower secondary school in 2015 have only the lowest and second lowest grade in mathematics. Norway is a country that will rely on technology in the future. If we don't manage to put up our, uh, put straight our record on mathematics and science in school, it will be trouble for this nation in the future. We have drawn up a target strategy to improve teaching of maths and science subjects in schools, to improve preschool activities in these uh, subjects. And we will give priority to maths in its major initiative to improve professional development of teachers. And we need more people who dare to set up uh, their own uh, business. As politicians, we can and must create the right conditions for those who want to transform their ideas into business ventures. The government has increased its allocation to business-oriented innovation by 2.4 billion Norwegian kroners, and we have drawn up a plan to promote entrepreneurship. And we must give people access to lifelong learning. The knowledge needed, uh, needed changes, so um, if you don't have the right skills, you are more likely to be left behind and be without a job. 
We also know that the proportion of elderly people in the population will increase, and high labor market participation rate is essential if you are to maintain good welfare services. And then, of course, in a more globalized world with more refugees coming, we must ensure that the newcomers to our country have the right skills to be able to participate in the Norwegian labor market. In the future, Norway will be part of a globalized world where capital, knowledge, and jobs are moving across national borders at an increasing pace. Our future value creation and our future welfare will depend on our success in building a knowledge society. In terms of production costs, Norway will never be the cheapest country, but we can be the smartest, and that should be our ambition. And knowledge is therefore a key factor for success and for enabling us to hold our, our own in the face of international competition. The government has presented a long-term plan for research and higher education, which stakes out the course for policy in this area for the period up to 2024. And we will increase allocation to research and higher education in six long-term priority areas. And this is where I also think a lot of the future for our businesses will be found. It's in oceans, it's in climate change, environment, clean energy, it's in public sector renewal and better and more effective welfare services. It's in enabling technologies to make sure that we are at the path where we're using the new technologies are in the forefront of that. And it's in innovative and adaptive business sector and world-class research groups. We need, to be honest, we need more world-class research groups in Norway. If you are going to be the smartest, we in fact have to improve the quality of research and we have to focus on some more on the best areas for the future. Cultivating more world-leading research groups is one of the key priority areas. We are lagging behind countries we tend to compare ourselves with when it comes to the quality of research. The government's ambition is to ensure that more Norwegian institutions are able to compete with the very best institution in the Nordic region, and more Norwegian research groups are among the world leaders in their field. Research results must, as far as possible, be measured on the basis of quality and the level of productivity. Professional study programs at university and university college must be designed to meet the labor market's need for skills and knowledge. In a global labor market, it's a great advantage for Norwegian students uh, pursuing their studies or part of their studies abroad. And that foreign stu students are studying at Norwegian educational institutions. So I'm happy that I'm seeing so many here. It's also been necessary to change the structure of the higher education sector and to concentrate resources on fewer and stronger institutions. The government's aim is to create a structure for research and higher education sector that ensures outstanding research and top quality education. Several universities and university colleges have already uh, agreed to merge, and the government is allocating 175 million Norwegian kroners to support these mergers in 2016. I know that NO is not merging with anybody. That means that you just have to prove your high quality for the years to come. So make sure that uh, your decision to not, to, not to merge with anybody uh, also stands out as the best decision for your institution. Another important aim is to increase the overall level of investment in research. In the long-term plan, the government set out its intention to increase allocation to research and development to 1% of GDP by 2020. Changes in GDP and short-term initiatives may mean that this figure will change somewhat from year to year. Nevertheless, our efforts have paid off so far. We are able to exceed the 1% target in the budget proposal for 2016, and it will continue. And I, by that, we have met one of the big targets for investments in, uh, in research in Norway. The second target we have 
to improve the overall up to 3% depends on getting more businesses who are more intensive in their own research work. That still lags behind in Norway. And I think it, uh, that's why we're also trying to stimulate that to different measures uh, on, on, on partnerships on research and development. In the years ahead, it's going to be important to ensure that the plan is fully implemented. In addition, we will encourage private companies, as I said, to carry out more research. We are using that through the Scottifun, the tax in incentive scheme, which together with another, a lot of other uh, schemes will help uh, stimulate increased private investment in research and development. To sum up this, we are living in a more unstable world. Uh, we still believe that Norway can be a winner. We have what it takes to succeed, even if our world around us will be more volatile. We have the knowledge and the skills, we have resources, we have ideas, we have manpower. We are quite uh, good at implementing new technologies. But we know that this doesn't go by itself. You need to have a long time focus on what popular in Norwegian called umstilling, which might be tiring for somebody. In Norway, we often like to have new words on things every second year. I think we have to live by the world that Norway will be in a changing transition when umstilling for the next uh, 10 years, maybe more, to be sure that we are that success I think we can be. And many of you here today will play a key role in society and in the business sector in the future. You can do that by creating new jobs in profitable industries, by helping to ensure a place for everyone in the labor market, and by helping to finance our welfare systems, and by taking part in common efforts to solve global challenges. By this, you will also be partner in safeguarding Norway for the future and uh, help us uh, to make sure that the Norway that uh, your parents' generation have uh, lived very well in is going to be a very well place to live in also for our grandchildren, your children in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Solberg. We have time for a few questions. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, my name is Jens Oderseip, and I'm a second year student here. You seem uh, very optimistic about the new green technology. Do you think it will be possible to reach our climate goal for 2050, and at the same time, have growth in private consumption. Thank you. Yes, I believe it's possible. I believe that the environmental footprint that we are, uh, are, are having per percent of growth in the future is going to be much, much smaller than what we've seen in, in history behind us. I think we can find new solutions. We can, I, I think we will find solutions to the climate change. The problem is if we will do it, will we do it fast enough? Uh, will we get the technology fast enough? This is a, this is a question of how fast we can do innovation. And, but I don't believe it's possible to reach those goals without also, um, also um, uh, ensuring that uh, we, we are fighting uh, the extreme poverty of the world. I don't think there's a possibility of reaching our climate goals without also fighting international uh, poverty and, uh, and the conflicts around. I think that's why I think the sustainable goals are so important uh, because you are taking the social framework and the, uh, and the environment challenges at the same time. And there is still a billion people in the world who need electricity. And it's going to be more than that in the years to come because Africa is growing so rapidly. So we will have to have more energy in the world. We have to develop more of those resources but if you don't create jobs on the way and opportunities, you will not get sustainable support for 
for making priorities, for example, of, of, uh, of uh, that, that uh, uh, is right for the environment. I think job creation and fighting global, uh, global uh, the emissions uh, and, 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 and the climate change is, have to go hand in hand. And that's why I don't believe in, in the thought that, you, that, that there is a conflict between the private consumption uh, uh, and, uh, grow, uh, and, and the environment. Question over there. Thank you, Erna, for your talk. My name is Mario. I'm assistant professor here. You mentioned mathematics. Uh, uh, in my course, I teach mathematical programming to make the best decisions. So I would like to ask you how you make decisions at the government. You have models, maybe, or you trust uh, uh, committees of experts. It's a lot of intuition, and in particular, uh, whether uncertainty makes you be more conservative when it comes to decision or more risk taken? I'm not sure if I knew all, all the aspects of your, uh, of your, I understood all the aspects of your question, but decision making in Norway is, um, it's long. <laughs> <laughs> um, usually if you do a big policy change, you will have a committee who works on it, and then you will have a, hearing period of that, and then you will start to adopt the different measures uh, uh, into policy on the broader new issues. That's what we very often do. And you have all the different groups coming with their views into the process. And then, of course, they will come to the parliament afterwards and give all their views of it. Um, that's, uh, that's the main work. It, we have a very thorough process of, uh, of making sure that the new suggestions in Norway are uh, have been uh, scrutinized well before we are, we are uh, proposing them. Uh, and, uh, and a very inclusive um, way of doing it be because all people will be allowed. Very often you will have experts, professors and experts and interest groups who are in this commission to, to work on, out the policy uh, proposal to the government. And, uh, and then, of course, it might take two, three years to change, and sometimes we have to do things more rapidly, but uh, there are, if you had studied social sciences, you would have found uh, stables of studies of uh, Norwegian decision-making process. It's a very cooperative uh, decision-making process. Dear Prime Minister, thank you for a great lecture. My name is Sjöver Hanken, I'm a second year student here at NHO. A uh, future shortfall in tax revenues from the oil industry will severely affect the possibilities politicians today have while deciding on a state budget. Do you think politicians in the future will just continue to eat out of the government pension fund, or do you think we will be able to adjust our public spending to a new reality? Thank you. I think, uh, I think the, whole, the whole idea is that we need to build uh, uh, other types of, of industries in Norway to give uh, so give enough revenue to uphold the running of this country. We cannot l rely on oil money for the future. But we are in a transition period now where we have to build up that new types of businesses, which means that I think there's a good reason why we should ma use money on research development, on, on getting a tax system that improves, uh, that, that, that encourages uh, investments, and, and that we should build those roads that we have forgotten to build for quite some, some uh, centuries because it has high costs for, for Norwegian businesses uh, uh, because we have a, uh, have a poor road and, and, and transportation standard. Um, in the future, I think the whole focus must be that we are having a basis that makes us independent of the oil, uh, or, or which I, in a way, don't want to say the money from the oil fund anymore because now we are getting money from international business. This is our ownership. Um, so even if we get less money into the, the, uh, into the fund, I think it will be important that we are not building down the fund in the future, which is a, which, uh, which we, uh, and how we do that is basically that we need to improve the growth in the rest of our economy. If we don't manage that, I think it will be impossible for politicians in the future not to use parts of that uh, fund also into, into our economy. But, but using the revenues, uh, we should do. We have to remember that we have used large scale of the best resources in our country of human people. We have focused that into one business area uh, so that a share of what we have put into the oil sector, of course, should come into the, the generations today, not just the generations of the future. And I think that change was what we did in 2001. 
because we don't have a basis in our economy to hold up our budget and our welfare uh, without taking a little bit part of, of that income too. One final question in front here. Thank you for your speech. I'm Yuta Kojima, an exchange student from Japan. I have a question about education. Is uh, economic growth is the only purpose of education? Uh, if the there is no economic growth, uh, do you say the education policy is failure? Otherwise, uh, what do you think uh, the individual students or entire society can benefit from education uh, other than the perspective of economics. Thank you. Now, I think there's a lot of other reasons why we should have universities and do research and studies. We have an excellent middle age, uh, um, uh, middle age history um, research group at the university in Bergen because of the history of this, uh, uh, history of this city. It gives you enormous interesting uh, results back. Of course, you do medical research and, and invest in that uh, because you want to solve uh, health issues. It's not purely economic growth, but it's also partly economic growth. Uh, why, uh, and, and when we say we want a large increase in the funding for, your, for research and development, it's based uh, on the need for our society to become more productive. Uh, and more pro being more productive means that you can uh, can uh, finance the, the uh, society in the future. And as Japan, Norway is not as fast as Japan, but we have an aging population. Um, you still have a quite big labor market reserve in your women. You know, you should get more women to work after they marry, get children, <laughs> just, just to say that. Uh, we have done that. This is, it's a good part of the Norwegian success story. I'll take it back with you. It's, uh, uh, but, uh, but there's a lot of other reasons why we do it, but, for the, for ec but education and uh, leads to more productivity is an important part of the economic growth. But yes, we should uh, take partnership in solving the big issues of the world on a lot of areas that would not lead to, n to economic growth by itself, and, uh, and uh, knowledge both about our history and more about the future is, uh, has a, a reason in itself, not just because it leads to economic growth. Thank you very much. I'm afraid the time is up again. Uh, thank you, Anna Solberg, for a very interesting lecture and conversation.